All right. Welcome everybody to today's tech talk, which is securing identities in the cloud. Microsoft's efforts to combat security threats using Microsoft Entra ID. Before we get started, uh, we just want to do some very basic housekeeping items. Uh, so this session is being recorded and it will be available on Quest.com shortly after. Uh, you'll also be getting a follow up email from Katie, um, who's also on this call. So, you know, be on the lookout for that as well. Throughout the actual presentation, please use the chat to ask any questions. We welcome that. Um, we'll get them answered throughout the presentation, but for the sake of continuing and just so we can get through the content, we'll be also saving time towards the end where the guys can't go in and answer any questions that you might have. But throughout the presentation, again, please use the chat to ask anything that you'd like. Uh, we have two cybersecurity experts on in the background to answer your questions throughout the chat. Uh, which is Jennifer and Anna. Uh, they'll be in there. Uh, if there's something they can answer themselves, they're the experts, they'll go in and you know reply. Now, with that being said, let's turn things over to our presenters, Microsoft's Ramiro Calderon and Principal Program Manager, Jorge Lopez, Senior Program Manager. Go ahead, guys. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And, and thank you, Quest, for having us again. We're always excited to be here sharing all of the good things about, you know, uh, securing identities in the cloud and all of the stuff that we're going to talk about today with my colleague Ramiro here. Uh, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to get some uh, things to uh, to bring into focus and all of the conversations that, that we're going to have. And all of that is the importance of identity and the importance of securing identities in the cloud. And we'll start with some examples, right? And and this will just basically help us understanding like this importance, right? And we'll mention a few uh, cases that we saw last year. NGM Resorts uh, suffered an attack, a cyber attack that basically led all of the systems from NGM and not only NGM Casino, but also all of the other uh, you know, casinos and hotels that actually belong to the change, like Aria, Bellagio, Cosmo, and everything. Websites, reservation systems, even room keys where were unusable, slot machines, the whole thing. So imagine yourself coming to uh, your vacation in Vegas, and then all, all of a sudden, you, know, you cannot even get to your room. So that was that was a big loss for MGM. Uh, and it was kind of like caused by one of the, um, you know, latest social engineering attacks. So it was a little bit of a tactic to uh, convince some help desk uh, teams to, you know, do some password research and stuff like that. Uh, also, we have another case with Twilio actually suffered a breach that compromised millions of users, and the attacker in that case used SMS phishing tactics. So uh, it is very important for everybody and all of us to understand that it may only require one single phishing email to probably compromise the entire organization. That so. Um, I'm trying just to mention these examples to, uh, you know, bring you a little bit of the awareness of why it's important to protect all identities, right? Because in the other hand, like a lot of people think and a lot of organizations are like, I have all of my administrative accounts and privilege accounts protected. Attacks target every identity. So it could be user identities, it could be administrator identities. And lately, we have seen a lot of attacks into what we call workload identities. So those unattended identities, unattended users that may be running certain, you know, applications through service principles or all of the different things that usually lack uh, proper controllers to ensure that they have not been compromised because they're unattended. So there's things that you cannot do with those unattended identities, like doing multi-factor authentication that requires that human intervention to verify the identities, right? So we have seen that too. And there has been an increase on those type of attacks as well. To provide a little bit more examples, right? Mailchimp and and uh, all of the attacks that Lapsus did at some point in the last few years, that uh, they were targeting actually support accounts or support uh, engineer accounts and contractors or vendors that are also prone and vulnerable to these type of attacks, right? The Lapsus attack actually came from um, MFA fatigue. So even there was an MFA control and multi-factor authentication control in front of those identities, the attacker used some MFA fatigue, which was just sending that prompt for the MFA until the user got tired of it, and they ended up approving something. So it all comes to educational purposes as well and education of the end users and putting also more controls. What Microsoft 
then Tridea and organizations can actually do for you to prevent these type of things when the users may or may not be very aware of the things that you know may be happening in the security landscape when it comes to identities. So uh, some of the other things that we have been discussing, right? So admin identities are targets, user identities, then maybe do lateral movement, word look identities. What are the other targets that attackers will see? And we're talking about as well the another important point, which is target corporations and target supply chain and entire supply chains. And we saw something similar as well in 2021, the colonial pipeline case. And for all of those that are based out of the uh, East Coast in the US, I'm actually based out in Georgia. Uh, this was huge, right? Because there was a lot of gas shortage. The president of the United States actually declared a state of emergency because the shortage was so bad for all of the East Coast that uh, I do remember being at the lines for a couple of hours just to get some gas to, for the car and paying the triple of the price because of this shortage. Because basically pipeline or colonial pipeline is in charge of supplying 45% of the gas used in the East Coast. So they got attacked and they had a ransomware with a weak password. So, and the attack was kind of like following some known patterns with some advanced things like even running or doing dry runs of the attack. So they, uh, they acquired this credential that was exposed of a VPN account. That was the, the weakest link for this. Uh, then they started doing some lateral movements. We did some evasions techniques, profiling some of the target users that they wanted to do. They waited for the opportunity to strike. They even did dry runs until they actually got it. So uh, imagine yourself coming to work from, you know, on a normal day and then just find this screen that says that your network has been locked and then your organization needs to pay $2 million or more uh, to do this. And then uh, the results of that is unfortunately for Colonial Pipeline, they were forced to the last resort, resort which is pay the ransom to the hacker group. So uh, financial gain, and when it comes to supply chains that are important for a whole country, you may think as well that there are some cases where you will see these attackers targeting uh, even for political reasons, right? Not only financial gain. So have that in mind. Uh, okay, so uh, I hope that at some point we have a little bit of the context. I'm gonna pass it on to Ramiro, uh, then I'll take it back a little bit later uh, to continue building the story about why the identity uh, security is important for us. So Ramiro, take it on. Sure. Um, so one one thing I see Randy was asking about the license necessary to access this ability. So later in the presentation, we're going to unpack the different protections and capabilities that help to defend to some of these attacks. And uh, uh, we'll do our best to call out the licensing if it's anything um, uh, specific, but uh, for um, um, you know, you can assume that Entry DP2 would be a good baseline, and some, as we call out capabilities that require additional licensing, will, will, will do that. We'll try to do that. I, the, um, just we'll keep that in mind. So, um, let's unpack the identity attack surface. So, we saw some examples on like end-to-end -end, uh, attacks, and those attacks usually start with a vector. Um, sometimes in identity, sometimes in network, but what we're gonna do now is to go over that uh, pyramid of attacks, the different surface area on what they are trying to target. So the first one is the password attack. So here we have in the base of this pyramid of uh, doom and gloom, I guess, um, where we have the uh, most common trends on password attempts, uh, attacks. So we have breach replay, password spray and phishing, um, a quick show of uh, virtual hands, uh, if you are familiar with these terms, or there's something we need to spend more time unpacking. But these are, uh, okay, so I see a few show of hands, so familiar with the usual, right? So bridge replay, password spray, and phishing are our uh, most common uh, vectors of attack against passwords. Now, one interesting thing that you'll see, and especially with, um, with, uh, you know, remote work and people doing more stuff from from the 
the internet um, remotely is that we see that in 2023, the attempts or uh, the password, the combined number of attacks in the password spiked in 2023. So that not only includes the three bridge replay, um, the password spray and phishing that I mentioned, but the usual brute force and all that. So then we'll see that we are talking about like billions in the scale. Um, and uh, I think one stat here, I have a link there for the MDDR, Microsoft Digital Defense Report. And then we, we have even more set stats about how many attacks do we see and, 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 and block we're talking about millions of attacks per second that our platform detects and and and, and protects in that. So I mean, I, I just want to just sorry for interrupting. So there's a few people. There's a few of you that have your hand up. Uh, do you have a question? Feel free to post it in the chat. If this was kind of like that call out from Garmita saying that, hey, I, uh, who yeah. has or who's familiar with this? Yeah, Feel free to lower it. It happens all the time, the virtual hand versus the thumbs up. So I do it. Uh, ju I just want to make sure that we're covering well, those questions if you have some. I should have called that out. Uh, yes. So uh, let's keep going here and talk about then the next layer of attacks. So what is the protection uh, against password attacks? Multi-factor authentication. So that is the next level of the targeting of what the bad actors want to go after. So then we see vectors uh, that are specific to some of the methods, right? So we have SIM swap, SIM jacking, um, one of those techniques, particularly against phone calls and the SMS, others like MFA fatigue or brute force bombing the user with so many prompts that eventually they will uh, probabilistically go and approve some of those social engineer uh, and uh, advanced phishing with uh, adversary in the middle. So those kind of attacks we're seeing, uh, even though it's not billions, as we saw in the password, we'll see that these are trending also um, up, and we're talking about tens of thousands per month. So you see that once we have MFA in place, any kind, we are significantly slashing the the number of attacks but it's non-zero now one thing to keep in mind is that those attacks uh as we see from our uh let me see you can see my laser pointer um the uh, the, the methods are still by and large going through traditional telecommunications um uh, telco uh based methods, right? So voice calls, SMS, and then we have push notification. So these are uh, what we see as, as uh, brute force, or you know, as I mentioned before, like bombing MFA prompts so many that eventually we'll get, or people calling social engineer, pretending there is a support engineer and saying, hey, uh, for your security, we are investigating on, on something along those lines, like <laughs> social attack. Um, and then the users willingly give the TOTP or whatever else, and then the bad actor takes from there. Now, another area that we're seeing that is kind of related to what I'm saying is what we call adversary in the middle, right? So some methods, let's say it's an authentic air app um, or a uh, you know, one-time passcode that we see in the rolling code. Um, some of those are vulnerable to what we call adversary in the middle, meaning uh, the attacker can create a website that is identical to the identity provider, and then they just basically either create identical pages or or create some sort of proxy uh, where they uh, relay exactly the same UI as the original provider. The users go on typing the codes and the passwords, etc., and then the the bad actor can sort of replace that based on on what they learn. So um, we see that we're talking about ten, like still in the order among two thousands, but less. And this is just a small rolling sample. Um, by the way, one thing that you have seen here is that some of these sources come from different products that as customers use, they will have that directly on their either dashboards or in their um, you know portals to see themselves, uh, but this is what we see in aggregate from our telemetry. 
So that gloom and gloom here a little bit, but this is with fishable credential tags. So that's what we are kind of um, looking into those kind of credentials that are better than MFA, but just password, but still are susceptible to that kind of phishing or advanced attacks, if you will. Now, the next layer is when the bad actors go after uh, attacking the session. So previous elements were around attacking the credentials themselves, which basically as you successfully capture a credential uh, or can use a credential, then you can create sessions from scratch at will, right? So, so that's one. But then the other is if you are short of that, then capturing individual uh, sessions uh, or or more advanced go after the infrastructure, which is like even more <laughs> at scale. So here we are seeing again some trends from our digital defense report from from last year that token replace on the rise. Uh, and again, this is not going to get better; it's going to get worse. Um, these are typically requiring some sort of malware running in the machine or some advanced capability. But as you know, bad actors <laughs> collaborate a lot uh, to make these toolkits available at scale amongst the um, bad actor community, I guess. Um, so we'll see those uh, attacks that basically uh, extract, exfiltrate, either misuse, a token within the same endpoint or same device or, or exfiltrate that uh, token from a legit device to a different device uh, and then kind of go from there. Um, so that is another trend that we're seeing. And then the other one I think is a little bit uh, related to the story that um, uh, Jorge was mentioning about um, the Colonial Pipeline and similar. All these start with a more sophisticated attacks um, that include the on-premises infrastructure. So here, as an example, um, um, we have uh, the entry ID and may have collaborate a configuration of a federation provider. Then bad actors go on either through on-premises go and penetrate the on-premises environment all the way to the federation system and then they take um, the um, token signing certificate in this case a fetish product like adfs or similar and then at this point they can mean tokens to become anybody on the tenant um, so that's why it is important to see that this is just a part of a multiple um, vectors that actors can kind of progressively execute. Um, so those are um, kind of um, the, the types of attacks. But um, now that we have done that, let's unpack a little bit what are the strategies to secure identities. And what we're going to do is as we navigate the rest of the presentation, we're going to share a little bit uh, the protections and correlated to these attacks. Now, there are three major kind of categories of capabilities that we are sharing today. One is what are the enhancements of uh, password attacks? As I mentioned before, any method of multi-factor auth is going to um, protect and mitigate some of these password attacks. But then the next frontier is to look into phishing resistant authentication methods. So they are not susceptible to uh, those kind of attacks. And then we have a more like defense in the capabilities that are needed to protect against uh, session infrastructure attacks. So with that, I'm going to hand it back to Jorge so he can talk, take us. So I, 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 I did all the scary stuff now. Um, the Jorge is going to talk us uh, through the uh, um, good news um, moving forward. Thank you, Ramiro. And yeah, so hopefully at this point, everybody is scared enough to understand like what is the importance of all this stuff, right? So uh, that's what we wanted to make it like a, uh, two-person conversation, so you don't feel that you know scary story just for one of us. So uh, both of us are kind of like trying to either bring the focus into all of the things. So now let's talk about the good news, right? And the good things that you can do to prevent all of these different things. And by the way, uh, David had a very nice question on the chat, Ramido, about um, you know password protection, uh, password attempts to lock out accounts. So I provided some information there 
David, thank you for the question. If you have additional questions, I'm sure that we can follow up on that. Um, so how do we protect uh, against these uh, identity attacks, right? So um, let's start with uh, one thing that is very important, that is more relevant than ever. And David, this comes back a little bit to your question too. Identity protection is more relevant than ever. So detection and response that is embedded in the authentication path. So some of you may have seen this already. Uh, identity protection is not necessarily a new feature, but the main point that I want to make is that it keeps getting better. So now with AI and machine learning and all of these models gets better, there's more information, there's more data. We receive all of these uh, uh, terabytes, and I think at the point where petabytes of data to determine like uh, you know suspicious behaviors and designings. So not everyone is using MFA, but we want to make sure that we have more adaptive policies generated by recommendations uh, by AI. So AI with the models that can just tell us if there are any specific patterns that doesn't look common, that doesn't look right. A user trying to sign in from an unfamiliar location, uh, a token that there seems to be something not quite right with that specific token. So we will flag that as a high risk sign in or a high risk user. Uh, and, and then just basically administrators can take actions based on that, whether you want to require the user to provide MFA uh, out of band or block that specific signing or take some other actions, right? So identity protection, it's it's that feature that is always, you know, evolving because there's more data and we also have more detections too, which is this on the next slide, right? So adapted authentication, it's, uh, it's important because we have all of these risks, right? So rather than just focusing on something that is specifically to say, if you come from this location, you cannot sign in. That's fine. That's great. I mean, it's better than having nothing. But what about making it more adaptive, right? So I will only take any security actions if we determine that there's something that has been compromised, specifically on your password or these unfamiliar locations. So those that you see on uh, highlighted here are some of the new detections that we added and we haven't stopped there and we won't stop we keep adding more and more detections as we get more data and we have all of these new capabilities right so new countries malicious ip addresses activity from anonymous ip addresses store browsers uh you know suspicious inbox inbox manipulation uh api traffic that is suspicious uh anomalous token which is something uh super interesting because we can now determine based on all of these models if one of those tokens may have been tried to replay based on these other attacks that Ramiro mentioned, like the machine in the middle type of thing, right, through a proxy or something. So identity protection is one of those main features that will have all of these advantages to that. And it is also important to understand that all of these conditional access policies, identity protection and, and, and controls can have other integration with some of our other, you know, first party apps like Microsoft Purview. This is fairly new. We just released this. It's in public preview. And we integrated conditional access policies with Purview. And Purview will provide that control to detect the specific uh, risk levels based on insider risk. And you can put conditional access policies to say if there's an elevated risk coming from Purview, moderate or minor, then Maybe you want to take some actions like block the user or require MFA or something like that. So it's it is a mostly block access is what you want to do for these insider uh, risks, right? Uh, this type of prevention can detect if maybe a user is downloading high sensitive files or highly confidential files from a SharePoint site more than ten times on a day, right? So it's something that will be detected as an elevated risk. And then you can integrate it into enter ID to basically take some actions like blocking that user from doing it. So that comes the detection that comes from purview. So super cool and super important. Like I said, we keep working in a lot of, a lot of these things. Something that is very important to mention is that attackers and, and all of these different attacks are getting more complex and complex over the time, as Ramiro mentioned, right? So we cannot stay behind and just say like we put this control in place. Now that said, no, we keep working all of these detections and, and improving them. All right, so from now on, you're going to start seeing some of these things. Um, I'm just going to highlight with the laser real quick. Uh, this is squares just mentioned some of the things that will, uh, when we, as, as I talk to you and Ramiro talks to you about some of the features that we have, 
uh, you will notice uh, what type of attack we're preventing with those. So stronger credentials will help you with SIM hijacking, MMV fatigue, social engineering, and advers adversary in the middle as well, or machine in the middle. Uh, and this specific feature talks about authentication strengths. So you can configure uh, a specific type of strong authentication through conditional access when somebody's trying to access a maybe highly sensitive application. Maybe that user already performed MFA with something that is lower security, let's call it SMS or voice. But when they try to access this application, you want them to do something stronger, like Windows Low for Business, uh, fish resistant credentials like FIDO2 keys or security keys or even certificate based authentication. And that is pretty common if you are part of a, a US Gov organization. So you can set that up as part of the authentication strength. Maybe set up a different type of stronger authentication for a specific app. Uh, it also gives admins a deeper control of what type of authentications you allow and you want to secure as part of your intra ID tenant. And this also includes uh, advantages for external identities. If you are familiar with the B2B uh, scenarios, bring your own identity type of thing, uh, business to business relationships, you can apply security and authentication strength to those external guest identities as well. Some of the other enhancements that we have been working on in the Authenticated app uh, we have number matching and additional context to prevent MFA fatigue, right? So in this way, you have a control that says like you, uh, for the MFA fatigue scenario that we mentioned, instead of being, you know, uh, requested this MFA prompt numerous times and the only options that you have are two, like allow or deny, well, even if, uh, you know, by mistake, you can just press the wrong button and says allow, and then you just allow an attacker to get into your account by allowing that MFA prompt. With number matching, we prevent that because you have to be on the screen and from the application that is generated that prompt to actually type the number of your, on your authenticated app to, uh, to uh, basically allow and approve that prompt. Uh, we added a little bit more like authentication or um, uh, you know context, which is uh, you can see a little map where the authentication is coming from, where the request is coming from, what is the application that is generating that specific prompt and some reporting capabilities that says it's not me. So you can just basically uh, make sure that you are uh, the, the person that is approving is, is actually the person that should be approving that MFA prompt. Okay, so what else around token theft, right? Uh, we have stronger sessions and we have token protection that basically, uh, and, and I believe it just went uh, GA in the last few weeks, I will have to check, but it was in public preview uh, for some time. So this actually allows you to mitigate this attack around the token theft, which is you can require now token protection capabilities, and you can make sure that, that there's a secure relationship between the token and the device that that token was generated, right? So we ensure that the token presented contains a client secret of the device that that token was given to. And without this secret, without this client secret or handshake, the token is just invalidated and the user cannot sign in. So those uh, type of controls prevents the token replay, uh, you know, attack that we have seen often and often as well. Uh, continuous access evaluation as well. Uh, I'm not sure, Ramiro, if this was something that you take up from here, I believe so. If not, I'm happy to continue. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, I can take it. Sorry, I was looking at uh, Joseph's question about the pre purview uh, alert in GCC. Uh, so, Jorge, you can take a look. And I'll, I'll, I'll take a look. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, continuous access evaluation is basically um, a way to overcome uh, two challenges. One is that when we give a token and the token is, let's say, uh, has a set direction, duration of, let's say, one hour, then what happens if the user is fired like two minutes into that hour? So you have 58 minutes of the token being accept, acceptable to work um, to the workloads because that that's what they the workloads typically validate. Is the token valid? Is the signature correct? And if so, then I will pull the email or documents from SharePoint, whatever else, right? So with continuous access evaluation, we're bringing a capability to provide a channel to revoke some of these sessions depending on conditions. So the conditions typically are um, around the account lifecycle. So in the case that I said, 
uh, if the user is fired or the account is not is disabled, then that will trigger a uh, back channel between the identity provider. Um, uh, let me take control back. Um, the identity provider, in this case, Entra, back to the um, so this back channel between the identity provider and the workload to say, hey, this account. If you see this the token for this account again, this account has is now revoked. So then they can uh, try to pose that token. You check that this was revoked, and then we reject back. So that gives us that protection uh, against those kind of uh, events that can happen over time. So that's one I mentioned before: account enable, disable. The other is if the risk of the user changes. Uh, like let's say you get a token five minutes later the user gets a high risk for whatever reason right let's say a, a detection uh, of that was calculated offline com com completed calculation and the user is now at risk uh, let's say um, speaking about the previous one we have a, a detection that says password spray so password spray is a detection that entra calculates and then um, triggers uh, um, it increases the risk of the user. So if you have a policy that says, hey, medium risk and all that block access, then this will be a way to kind of reevaluate that. So the idea here is as the users get the token revoked, then the client, that's why we say CA capable, kind of re reattempts to log in to the uh, ID provider, and then we reevaluate the policies over again. So that is a tool that we definitely want the customers to use. It's uh, available in our uh, core of Microsoft 365 services. Um, and the idea is that uh, as the ecosystem evolves, then we'll have more and more um, um, workloads that do that. Uh, one other thing is we have some detections also about moving uh, between if you want to configure, hey, uh, I always expect my traffic to come to a subset of IP addresses. So whenever the traffic comes outside that IP address range, then we consider that suspicious. Therefore, we send you back to recalculate. So this is a very cool capability. One thing that this also allows is to have longer session times because now we have a way to revoke. The session then we can give longer live tokens because it doesn't matter right so you can you can always communicate to the workloads hey reevaluate the session because the, an event occurred so those are um uh, you know it's not only improving the user experience but also um gives us that channel to revoke now another capability um is in conditional access is the ability to protect what we call uh, workload identities or service principles uh, or a application registration. So the idea is that when we have non-human identities like a user uh, attempting to get uh, a workload, we have a service principal trying to log in on behalf of a user to do something in the back end um, and similar. So we have that ability to protect those uh, workload identities with conditional access. This requires an additional license specific to workload identities. And the idea is that you can configure, for example, the service principal always comes from a well-known set of IP addresses. So basically when you move outside that, then it's suspicious, therefore we block. Or similarly, we can also create policies to say, if you folks are familiar with how service principles in Entra work, you can use either a client secret, which is basically a glorified password, uh, or a, a certificate, right? So, so these conditional access policies also allow you to say, hey, I only allow certificates. So again, back to that credential strength discussion. Um, here, another thing that we're doing is identity protection. So we have a concept of calculating risks for those service principles or non-human accounts to also have that same approach. If some signals accrue to that risk, then we block um, or we block or whatever report trigger investigations depending on, on these identity protection risk detections here. Um, 
Another thing that we are doing also is uh, improve conditional access for external identities. So this is more tools for administrators uh, to target a subset of guests in a particular category of policies. So we have, for example, so it's not just an external user or a B2B guest. It could be a guest um, that is uh, using Teams, so so there are some technologies that, that let me take a step back. So we have multiple flavors of external collaboration. So the most common that probably you already have seen in your environment is B2B collaboration. So when you guest uh, somebody to collaborate in a team or when you share a document with somebody from other organization in uh, in a SharePoint, et cetera, that creates a footprint that's called a guest user. So you can create policies get, targeting those guests. Um, you can guest uh, users. Um, there are many other combinations, like you can make a guest a, or collaboration a member instead of a guest, which changes the permissions. So this is a typical pattern where you have a conglomerate of companies that are separate tenants, but they need to collaborate a lot. So um, try to keep an example. Uh, Anyways, I don't want to name drop customers necessarily since this is being recorded, but two companies that are, um, you know, same conglomerate uh, that just share. So, so you can target policies with that particular set of um, uh, policies. One thing that you can do is basically uh, specialize. So you have partners that you know that are working closely with you and you have some you know, mutual betting of your policies and your posture, then you can optimize the experience for those users so that, for example, let's say Quest and Microsoft, right? So if Microsoft and Quest collaborate and then they uh, discover that, hey, uh, so Quest, when we have a guest coming from Microsoft, we know that they do strong auth and passwordless and all that. So when we have a policy that says required, MFA, then we are going to quote unquote accept the MFA that they bring from the Microsoft organization. So you can create those kind of specialized policies targeting particular organizations to make sure that uh, you can uh, kind of use those signals to compute your own policy. Um, so that also works for devices. So if you say require compliant device and then you trust, you create that. Uh, com collaboration settings say, hey, when I create a policy that says require compliant device and it's uh, somebody from Microsoft uh, coming to Quest, then they will accept my compliant device coming from Microsoft side. So you can create those kind of um, uh, settings to trust those other organizations. Uh, another cool thing that we're doing to help customers administrate better is what we call protected actions in conditional access. So conditional access is um, a, an engine, right, um, that typically targets actions or like applications. Now this concept is to apply to actions where, um, you know, when we target a particular administration action, you can associate a policy to kind of kick off on demand. So no matter how, for example, if you go and change conditional access policy here in the example in the portal through, uh, either the portal or PowerShell or graph, et cetera, this policy is going to kick in uh, no matter the interface you used. Um, so that's another area. So we're basically making sure that and no matter how uh, the actions happen, you can um, target those with policies. Other things that we're doing uh, in conditional access, uh, we created more visibility. So again, that's for your and as administrators, uh, you will see uh, um, a summary or a dashboard where you see uh, the coverage on policies, how is the policy compared to the signing activities, so what are the gaps, see trends of failures, et cetera. And then we create template, templates uh, based on best practices so you can deploy them easily in your environment. Uh, other things that we're doing in conditional access is uh, creating this engine of recommendations, so mentor ID recommendations, so every customer 
can see, um, you know, target and tailored uh, uh, recommendations for them to go on and execute and investigate. So something that we'd recommend you to keep an eye on and, and stay on top of to make sure that you increase your security posture as we go. Now back to Jorge to tell us a little bit more of another important principle, which is least privilege with identity governance. Thank you, Ramiro. And um, I still owe a few of you some answers. Uh, I'm still working on them. There's a lot of great, great, great answers here. Uh, questions, sorry. So I appreciate that. Uh, Joseph, I, I'm still checking about the GCC scenario, so I'll get back to you in a second. Um, all right, so let's try to accomplish some of the stuff around identity governance, right? Because at the end of the day, identity governance is also related to security. So let's talk about some of the things that uh, you may have seen before around privileged identity management or PIN. I'm just going to talk to you about the importance and some of the things that have been released as a new features here and how do we integrate with you know protecting this identity so protecting privileged identities it's it's important right it still keeps one of the top things that you have to do uh, because you can instead of creating this uh, permanent uh, role for somebody you can make them eligible so they have to take specific actions before they, they activate their privileged roles and PIM can be implemented with things like microsoft enter id roles uh, Azure RBAC roles or role-based access controls for Azure in general uh, and groups as well. So you can create one single group that may have access to multiple roles or multiple things uh, and then create this privileged identity management workflows that can come with, with an approval if you need to and are limited of time to become members of that specific group that will then give them access to maybe some other roles, right? So um, you can require different policies for each uh, role assignment of groups. We call it actually privileged access groups too. So they're not normal groups in Enter ID, they're actually privileged groups as well and assigned to multiple roles if you need to. So the idea is not necessarily get somebody to approve your activation of a role. That's fine if you want to set that up. Uh, it's flexible to to do those type of things. Uh, but at the end of the day is the fact that you need to reduce your attack surface by not having those specific identities to be permanent uh, and on, on a specific privileged role, especially, especially if you're talking about uh, global administrators and whatnot. Uh, an important thing that we also released uh, uh, in the last few months is PIM and conditional access integration. So. What are the benefits of, of this, right, of, uh, of this approach? Think about a conditional access policy that is only going to allow me to activate a privileged role if I come from a trusted device. And the trusted device would be in the virtue of things like, uh, let's call it um, uh, entry to join, hybrid joined, hybrid joined, or compliant. Maybe my device is um, it's compliant or is managed through some sort of uh, mobile device management like Intune. And as long as I'm compliant and my device is compliant, that's the only device that I can activate uh, my privilege access uh, through a role. Uh, think about the pause or the privilege access workstation scenarios where uh, maybe you just want to limit an administrator not to activate a specific role on a personal device. So uh, super important as well, uh, PIM plus conditional access integration. And I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm just going to touch base on some of the topics here around some of the controls that we have and some of the things that you can do. Enter permissions management is also uh, a feature that you can actually manage and see, get a report and get a comprehensive visibility into identities, permissions and resources. We created an index, we call it PCI permission script index that will show you that permissions gap. So think about somebody given permissions that have been granted for a specific role or specific actual resource. Uh, the, uh, and then through enter permissions management, uh, administrators are going to get a report that says this user has been granted all of these permissions, but in the last certain amount of time has been only using this, uh, these little two or three permissions out of the 100 that has been granted before. So we created that permission gap so administrators can now create these specific uh, custom roles if it's needed or just remediate those type of over provision permissions. So it is important as well to identify that uh, to create these discovery and access, remediate and manage, and then monitor and alert. Something that I haven't mentioned is that all of the things that you see 
We do have extensive logging, extensive audit logs that will will uh, just basically show that enter permissions management is available for multi-cloud. Uh, you can include uh, Google Cloud, Amazon, and of course, Intra. Um, and this is how it kind of looks like on, on the screen where you can actually see, you know, a little bit of the permission script index that I mentioned. The higher the score for that index, it means that the bigger the gap between the permissions granted and uh, what is what it was um, provided or, or what is being used by the user. So Microsoft Enter ID governance, another uh, fairly new feature. Uh, I want to highlight this because governance is security, right? We want to make sure that the, the people get access at the right time and the right access. We also want to make sure that when somebody leaves the organization, we have all of the automated tasks that will remove that user from any sort of access that the user has. Same for mover scenarios, right? Journey, mover, lever, all of the different things that you want to make sure that the right people has the right access. Um, because how many times have you heard that somebody left the organization two months ago and that account was still lingering around and still had access to some of the most important uh, applications from the organization? So you want to prevent that through identity governance. And we do it on an approach through access requests, through access packages that you can bundle specific applications, uh, groups or SharePoint sites in a, in a single place. Uh, and they create workflows uh, or create means to control that access when it can expire a certain time after a certain number of days. It can be assigned when, on, on joiner scenarios. It can be assigned through auto assignment policies or birthright that as long as you belong to this department, you get access to this. If you get out of that department, that access package is removed. So all of this bundle will get out of uh, you know, your, your, your list of permissions. Uh, access recertifications through access reviews as well. Of course, that intelligent recommendations based on machine learning that we can detect if somebody is actually using the permissions or using the application at some point. We have tenant level access reviews. We have application level access reviews as well. Is out of the box integration with Teams. So if you have external identities that are on your uh, organization, you can actually create this recertification and a reviewer will get a report to say, Looks like in the last 30 days, in the last 25 days, in the last three months, you name it, you can be as flexible as you want and set up access reviews every month, every quarter, uh, once a year, and get that report that says if somebody actually has been active on those recommendations. So I know I'm kind of flying because we have a little bit more content, content and I want to make sure that I leave some time for questions. Lifecycle workflows is another one to automate those joiner mover lever scenarios and just basically take, take those tasks on day one, things like uh, generated a temporary access pass for the user on the first day instead of having a temporary password floating around in multiple systems, uh, remove users from selected teams on the lever scenario, uh, send a termination email to the team if it's a lever. And for joiner, we also have some other templates that will have you know, uh, like I said, generate a temporary access pass, assign the user to specific groups, all of the different things, right? So uh, one of the things that I want to highlight here is the extensibility that a part of having just built-in tasks, we also have a particular way to launch logic apps workflows as part of uh, the joiner mover lever scenarios and maybe talk to another systems like ITSMs or any other external API through HTTP calls if that's the case. All right, so I know I kind of like flew here. Ramiro, if you want to take it back and take us home with Beyond Identity, what else do we have out there? Okay, so this this part of the session is most for you to be aware of what's coming to further your your posture and the you know further protect your environment. I know we're pressed for time, so this is just for your awareness. Um, uh, maybe in tech 2024 in Dallas, we'll have more dedicated sessions, but we just want to expose that to you. So one of the things that we have been working on beyond identity is an identity centric uh, secure software edge solution. So you can think of it as everything that you know on how identity works with conditional access and with the existing kind of ecosystem of how you manage applications, how you manage uh, identities um, to assign them to resources, et cetera. Think about that, but now covering the network connectivity. So what we do with this SSC solution is essentially uh, create a uh, 
a path for customers uh, whenever they have to connect to a network. Uh, let's say is a Microsoft 365, then, hey, what is the policy before that user can even start that connection at the network? So we basically created that tunnel uh, concept um, and intercepted at the, this client machine level uh, to execute policy. So that opens a net new capabilities to enable all these cool things that we have for modern applications. Um, so verify explicitly, use list privilege as on a bridge, but imagine this, uh, even to connect to the network. So we, this is basically us going in the territory of zero trust network access. So this is very high level um, um, kind of concept. Now we talk a little bit about uh, the different components. So we are breaking this offering in three different angles. So one is the internet access, well, two, sorry, two big buckets. So we have internet access. So basically when your users are connecting to a public SaaS application, um, we basically create a policy interception point to um, establish that tunnel. In the case of our own cloud of, of Microsoft 365, this also brings um, a, a, the backbone of Microsoft and the points of presence all over the world. So it's, it's not only security uh, entry point, it's also optimization of performance. So that will come through that entry internet access and it works not only for uh, Microsoft 365 applications, but also for basically any other internet options with the secure web gateway. And then the, the one that I'm particularly more uh, excited about uh, is the private access. So I don't know how many of you have um, um, sorry, I, I see a question from AJ, AJ, very cool question, hopefully. <laughs> Jorge can keep it, but it's a great question. I would love to talk about more of that. Um, but um, in just to touch on uh, AJ's question about Entra is uh, just a new name for what we have been doing. Uh, yes and no. So Entra is a brand that covers what we have done in as Azure AD for many, many years. And this slide that I'm sharing is a perfect example of us going beyond that. That's what we kind of evolve our branding to also cover beyond the traditional you know, enterprise side internet access management tool also include SSE, secure software edge, right? So in private access, for those of you who have been working closely with um, application proxy or similar, where we basically take an old app that was inside your corporate network and create some modern auth kind of plane for you to even get to that application. This is just the evolution of that to cover any other resource. So imagine a scenario where uh, you open up um, SSH session to a Unix machine that's in your data center on-prem. So you can create a conditional access policy targeting, hey, any every time that I go to this IP address with this port, here's the policy for that. Um, so that basically is ultimately ultimate modernization of access and protection of all those old apps. Um, and there are many, many other details that yeah, this is just for your awareness that we are working on, but this is kind of what the next frontier for us looking like to further protect this. So we are currently in public preview of some of these capabilities and then stay tuned for us getting to the GA. Now, we wanted to, to close down with this further message of uh, identity plus uh, as an extension or working closely with the, the security teams to have an extended the detect and response or XDR capability. So it's a common method um, or common uh, uh, partnership that we have with security team where you know identity and, and 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 security come close together. So you saw some integrations that we have with Purview, some integration that we have with Sentinel, uh, and all of these are basically blending those uh, the toolkit between those two um, typically siloed responsibilities in, in, in customers. Um, so um, that is kind of how we wanted to close down and just not gonna get into the details, but essentially this is just for you to have a sense of the entire picture uh, when we work with Defender, um, that we have a lot of things that are coming together and coalescing through Entra as the management play for identity, but there's a bigger picture 
and and you saw that conditional access and some others feed off of that to create a more holistic solution. And with that, I think this is all we have prepared for you folks. So hopefully we have a few minutes for Q and A. I don't know if the colleagues on the Quest side uh, want to have some wrap up uh, announcements, um, but uh, you know Jorge and I are here in the chat to answer any questions you may have. Yeah, I can do uh, a couple of quick housekeeping items that we can get to the Q&A. So yeah, I mean, thank you guys for the amazing presentation, first of all. Um, for the audience, thank you for you know listening through. That was great. Join us for the next Tech Talk, um, which is titled Not Today Satan, Securing Your Network by Blocking Adborne Malware. And that's taking place on Tuesday, March 28th. Uh, and the actual presenter is going to be Office Applications and First Services MVP since 2002 and Senior Director of Product Management at Keep It, Paul Robichaud. Um, it's going to be during the same time as this one. So uh, starting at 11 a.m. EST, uh, I believe Katie's going to be in there putting into the link. And also uh, make sure, you know, if you're enjoying these virtual tech talks, if you want more tech content in person with more access to speakers and experts, just like Jorge and Ramiro, uh, and just an opportunity to network with your peers, we are doing Tech 2024 in person, uh, and that's taking place in Dallas, Texas, USA, uh, October 1st and 2nd. Last year's event was in Atlanta, and it was incredible. Um, you can ask anybody here. You can ask the speakers here. Um, you know, it was definitely fantastic, so we would love to have you here. Katie, you know, please make sure to put that link in there, and we would love to see you. Uh, with that being said, I'd let you guys go back to the Q&A. You guys have been in there already doing a fantastic job answering almost every question that pops up. Um, if there's something that is there, if there's a question that popped up that you didn't answer, um, again, feel free to the, the floor is yours. So. Cool. Well, thank you. So we have a couple uh, lightning round. I see a question to Jorge. What is Microsoft ITDR products and service? I don't know. Did we get to that one or no? I think we did it specifically. So uh, ITDR, I think it's kind of like a wider concept of multiple tools, right? So within Enter ID, we we do have like some of the things for um uh you know for for detection like sentinel or hunting queries and then we have purview and then we have uh you know uh enter ID itself, conditional life and stuff and then control. So it, it's a lot of multiple tools and approaches that you will integrate as a concept of ITDR. I don't think there will be like a one specific thing that would say this is Microsoft ITDR is more like a collection of different tools and solutions that we offer. Yeah, uh, the one thing I would say on top of what Jorge was mentioning is that we have a protocol Microsoft Defender for Identity. It's mm -hmm. not 100% related to Entra, but it gives you some of that ITDR capabilities for your on-premises environment. So it, uh, it brings all, a lot of this uh, uh, intelligence regarding user behavior analytics um, into uh, your stack and then integrates with the rest of the ecosystem. So you will have a consistent uh, experience with the Azure portal and similar um, and integration with, with the rest of the stack. One question that I see that Francis bumped, uh, would not that overlap with some of the PAM policies and security controls? Is this direction enter ID to secure, protect, privileged users and connections with custom policies? I assume, is this related to, I assume this is related to the part we were talking about, uh, entrepreneurship management? Uh, I don't know the person who asked the question. I see unknown user, so I can't see the name. Um, but um, what uh, we want to uh, enable with Entra Permissions Management is to, uh, if we go over the official taxonomy, would be more in the keen territory, so cloud infrastructure, uh, and title management. So essentially, as you can think of this as a data warehouse where you have identities, with roles to achieve actions in resources. So you have that uh, view of, of your uh, Azure, AWS, GCP, subscriptions, projects, and accounts, and say, hey, um, by these resources, here's all the people who have access, is that right? Or by this identity, here are all the resources this, this, this has access to, and so on. So we have all that, um, the richness of analytics, uh, and then more importantly, the ability to, um, you know, hey, 
I want to cut back the permissions of this one identity based on their actual activity. So it's, it's, it's just all that relates to, to separate that. I don't know if that's what you meant by PAM policies, because uh, I, I don't kind of get the context on where, where in the presentation we were, uh, we were talking about that. But uh, if there are more questions on that, feel free to to uh, unpack that. Uh, I see, let me see. I think other than that, we have answered all questions. I think so, yeah, I'm looking through. I'm not seeing yeah. anything new. Looking through as well. Hopefully we, we were able to answer all of those questions. Um, still one about the purview for GCC. I think we were gonna have to take that back and, and somewhat coming back to you, Joseph, because so it's a great question. It is interesting and, and, and it's tricky, right? Because GCC tenants and the way that they're commercial with golf, it's, it's a little bit tricky. So I'm, I'm not sure. And I don't want to give you an incorrect answer for that. But uh, I think it's a safe assumption that this, there's some latency between us announcing a capability and reaching all the clouds. So yeah. All right, folks, so then if that is everything, then we are going to work with Katie and team to make sure that you folks have access to um, um, the, the slides. Uh, so thank you for your time. Yeah, no, thank you guys both for the amazing presentation. Um, thank you again for the audience. Yes, if you have a need for the deck, uh, feel free to email Katie. She put her email throughout the chat. Um, but just email her asking for the deck. Um, you'll you'll get it. And then next week you should be getting the follow-up email to this tech talk with the recording as well. Other than that, thank you guys again and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. For your time. Appreciate it. Bye. Thank you.